Today I'm going to talk about how the human microbiome adapts to its host. So I'm going to talk about evolution. And when I was in high school, I took a biology class, and I just thought it was like the worst possible subject. Um, and, and I didn't know why anybody would want to study it, because at, at that time in the state of Illinois, uh, we didn't have to talk about the theory of evolution. Instead, what we did is, you know, we, we memorized the, the dimensions and the land speed and the mass of, like, all the different animals. And that was only the, the first semester. The second semester, <laughs> we had to memorize that stuff about plants. I mean, that was, that was extremely tedious and boring. And, <clears throat> And then I got to college, and, and you know I studied math and computer science. Um, and I had to, in order to graduate, I had to take a biology class for, for non-majors. And I got halfway through my biology textbook, and there was a chapter on evolution. And at that point in my life, the only thing anybody had ever told me about evolution is that if you learn too much about it, you were going to hell. <laughs> so I was careful about not exposing myself to, to evolution and, and until, I, until I was forced to. And what I learned was that every living thing is descended from, from one, liv you know, one living thing, one common ancestor. And when I thought about like all those facts and figures that I had memorized up to that date, it was this epiphany that it must have been similar to, to what Darwin felt when you know, he came up with the idea because I had memorized you know, so many facts and figures about all the animals and plants. I just knew it was true. I knew it was true, and I knew that I just wanted to drop everything and, and study biology. I was pretty much done with, uh, with my math computer science degree, um, <clears throat> and I spent my last year uh, just studying biology. So hopefully I'm, I'm coming to this with uh, kind of a similar background to, to, to you guys, and, and, and I hope uh, um, you just have a, a, a similar experience being exposed to, to some of the cool things that are going on in biology today. Um, <clears throat> Right now, I'm, I'm very excited about the human microbiome. So maybe I'll start by uh, talking about what that is. So the human body is an ecosystem. We're not just one organism. And it's been said we have just as many microbial cells in our body as, as human cells. Um, there's microbial cells uh, basically um, anywhere that's considered kind of the exterior of the body, so that includes the GI tract, and of course most of these microbes are, are in the colon, um, but they're not just responsible for uh, metabolism and, and nutrition. Uh, a lot of uh, priming of immune cells and things like that happens with these microbes in, in, in the colon. And it's not just bacteria. There's uh, viruses. Those are part of the, the ecosystem. Viruses of humans, viruses of the bacteria play an important role. There's fungi. There's, there's little insects that live on our skin. <clears throat> and these microbes, they have an effect um, on, on our physiology. So this, this picture of two mice... These mice are, are brothers. They're, they're from the same litter. Uh, and this is work done uh, by my colleague Susan Erdman in the uh, Department of Comparative Medicine at, at MIT. And what she did is <clears throat> one of these mice was raised with, uh, with a probiotic, a lactobacillus reuteri, put into its drinking water, and, and the other was not. One of these mice is um, much slimmer than the other. One of these mice... 
um, has youthful hormone levels into old age compared to the other. And one has a, a really nice shiny coat compared to the other and thicker skin compared to the other. And this whole uh, range of phenotypes that, that we call the glow of health. And that's really from just, uh, just a single microbe being in the diet. <clears throat> We're learning a little bit about how these microbes uh, affect humans as well. So uh, I'll tell you a, a story of, um, about some work that was done uh, by a large international consortium and uh, my co-director, uh, Ramana Xavier, uh, at the Broad Institute and, and Mass General Hospital was, uh, was part of this study. <clears throat> and what they looked at is they looked at a town um, that, uh, it, well, it's in Finland, um, and after World War II, this one town was divided into two. And so half of it um, went to the Finnish side of the border and half of it went to the Russian side of the border. And on the Finnish side of the border, over the next few decades, uh, they saw dramatic improvements in uh, hygiene compared to the, um, uh, the town on the Russian side of the border. But it's the same people, it's the same genetics, they're really living the, the same lifestyle. So it was this, um, this experiment that would be very difficult and <laughs> certainly unethical to uh, reproduce in, in a research setting, but it was kind of this, this natural experiment. And what they found is that <clears throat> with these increasing hygiene levels um, came increasing levels of uh, autoimmune conditions like asthma and allergy. And what Dr. Xavier and, and his team were able to do was to identify specific bacteria uh, that were present in, uh, in infants um, on the Russian side of the border that were different from those on the, on the Finnish side of the border, and even metabolites um, that, uh, that were chemically, uh, structurally, a little bit different um, when they were produced from the microbes that were the uh, bifidobacteria that were found on the Russian side of the border compared to the bacteroides found on the Finnish side of the border. Uh, and they showed how those have different effects in priming and activating uh, immune cells uh, that later uh, you know, are likely responsible for a lot of these uh, increases in, in autoimmune conditions. Okay, <clears throat> so hopefully I've convinced you that the, the microbiome is interesting. It, it has a lot of um, health effects. But uh, I like to ask this question, why do you think we're studying the microbiome finally in, in 2023? Like why, why is this an emerging area of research um, just over the past decade or two? What was the technological or scientific advance that created, you know, this uh, explosion in, in microbiome science. DNA sequencing, right? Um, <clears throat> and DNA is, uh, it's, it's digital information. Like this, this is our microscope. So everything I'm going to talk about um, these are inferences that, that we make from, from DNA. So, so <laughs> uh, I kind of did the right thing going for that math and computer science degree um, to, to end up studying the, the microbiome. Um, and that's, uh, you, know, I, you know, I think I can say, well, DNA is digital information and, and everybody will kind of agree with that. You know, the, the first bit says um, whether you get three hydrogen bonds in, in, in the DNA strand or two, and the second bit says whether you have an extra five-membered ring um, on the base uh, or, or you don't. And so those are, those are your two bits, and so every, every base has, has these two bits. Um, <clears throat> but it's really, really um, unusual uh, information. So in, in a genome is encoded uh, the blueprint for how to build a machine that can not only rebuild itself, it can, it can make the machines that literally read the message and, and reproduce the message and reproduce all of the machines. It can repair itself. <clears throat> 
It can grow new copies of itself just using sunlight and carbon dioxide and, and nitrogen. Uh, and it can perform chemical syntheses that um, some of which, like, we don't know how to do. It's pretty phenomenal. And you would think if, you know, if, if we were to build a machine like that, um, it, would, it would be big, right? Just the blueprint itself would be enormous. Um, this, this picture of a blueprint, this JPEG over here, that's the same amount of information in, in one of these machines, in an E. coli. It's a megabyte, okay? So this compressed picture is the same amount of, of information as, as one of these organisms that can, that can reproduce itself. And an episode of Squid Game is the same amount of information as in the human genome. And, and I'm exaggerating here because, uh, well, <laughs> people will argue with me, but most of the, most of the information in the, in the human genome is junk. Uh, how do we know that? Um, well, I'll tell you later, um, pretty much every organism on the planet uh, acquires mutations at the same rate. And so we can look at the rate at which human beings acquire mutations and kind of infer um, how big the human genome really is relative to a bacteria. And, and it's about as big as, uh, you know, the number of coding genes, which means all that, all that other stuff. It, it, uh, there's a little bit of information in there, but, uh, but not much, okay? So humans, probably not more than a couple, a couple of megabytes. Um, <clears throat> I find that hard to, hard to even think about, how to, how to encode all of this information in such a tiny, tiny message. But the, the thing that does that is, uh, is evolution, right? OK. So I want to tell you how, um, how evolution shapes the, the microbiome and, and you know, short time scales and, and um, maybe longer time scales as well. Um, let's start out with how a particular host uh, affects the dynamics of the, of the whole ecosystem. So when I started studying the microbiome, my graduate student and I um, <clears throat> decided, well, maybe the best way to study it is uh, to collect our own gut samples, collect our own poop samples, right? Um, store those in a, in a freezer for, for a whole year. And then, uh, and then we'll just like see what happens. And then we'll record like all of the things that we can possibly think of. We'll record everything we eat. Uh, we recorded like 300 different behaviors. <laughs> it took hours every day to, to record all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll see what has an impact on the microbiome. So on the top is my microbiome um, over the course of a year. And on the bottom is, uh, is my student, uh, Lawrence David, who's uh, now a professor at Duke. It's his microbiome over the course of a year. And what you can see is that uh, there's variation day to day, but I could pick any day from the top series, and you would know that that was mine, and any day from the bottom series, and, and you would know without any you know, statistical testing or pattern matching or anything like that. You just look at it, and you would know that was, uh, that was his, right? Um, <clears throat> if I zoom in, and so now I'm, I'm looking at Lawrence's microbiome, here, uh, the, uh, the columns here, the x-axis, is still time over the course of a year, okay? Um, the, the rows are the different uh, bacterial species, and red means there's more of that bacteria on that particular day, blue means there's less of that bacteria on that particular day. And so during the, during the study, um, Lawrence's uh, fiance she got an opportunity to do an internship in, in Bangkok. So Lawrence moved to Bangkok. Almost as soon as he got off the plane, you can see that big blue patch. So a lot of the bacteria that were native to uh, his gut, uh, they kind of disappeared. And they were replaced with those, uh, those red bacteria on, on the very top. 
And those red bacteria, <laughs> some of them I had to look up uh, because they were, they were sort of weird, opportunistic um, GI pathogens. And so this pathogen stayed with him like the entire time he was, uh, he was in Thailand. And then almost as soon as he got back, they went away, and, and his traveler's diarrhea went away, and, and he just kind of resumed as if he had never left. Um, this is my microbiome, <clears throat> and so uh, about you know, two-thirds of the way through the study, colleague invited me out for brunch. I ordered the chef's special French toast, uh, came complete with some salmonella, and... Um, my microbiome uh, was radically changed. And so you can see that big um, blue patch on, on the top there. There are a bunch of species that were wiped out. Um, a few of them, maybe a quarter of those on the very top, they, they came back after a couple of weeks. Um, but many of them were just gone forever. And then uh, they were replaced with uh, that big um, uh, uh, red patch underneath. They were replaced with uh, entirely new uh, microbes that I picked up from, from the environment. And now I want to just go back. So series A, that's me, right? And so you can see when I got the food poisoning, that big you know, green blip there. And if you look before and after I got food poisoning, you can't even tell there was a difference. And so what that means is... <clears throat> Even though the particular species of uh, bacteria that were in my gut got completely wiped out and replaced with new ones, they were replaced with bacteria that were just, you know, like a different shade of, of uh, the purple there, right? They were replaced with about the same amount and the same kind of bacteria but just different ones, whether they were living at really low levels in, in my gut beforehand and we just couldn't see them, or whether I picked them up from the environment. Um, there's something about uh, my genetics, my diet, uh, the, the rest of the species in that ecosystem that selects for this particular microbiome in me. There's, there's a resilience there um, that, that is still a mystery that we still don't really understand. Okay, um, <clears throat> how are we using this uh, uh, clinically? Well, um, for, for a long time, I've wanted to do this study where we kind of do the same thing, but we look at uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And inflammatory bowel disease um, is uh, a disease where there's chronic uh, episodic flare-ups um, of uh, in inflammation. And what I would really like to do is be able to predict in advance when flare-ups are going to happen. And so that was the idea of this trial is, you know, can, can we enroll patients? Can we sequence the microbiome? Can, um, you know, we, we have wearable devices. We, we try to collect as, as much data as, as we can um, and then use that, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of in phase one right now, which is uh, can we collect the data can we observe patients over a year? And then later, can we go back and try to build a predictor in advance of when patients are, are, are going to have a flare-up? Uh, and that's the idea. Um, this is some, some early data back from, uh, from our trial. And so, so here's one patient. And, and you can see this patient, um, they had a flare-up at, at week 26. It kind of went down at, at, at week 39 and then maybe another uh, uh, you know, tiny flare-up, a little inflammation at week 51. Um, and we can see there's many bacteria here. So uh, we see a different signal in, in every patient, but if we look for these bacteria and we say, um, which are the bacteria that uh, have a, um, a non-stationary distribution over time. So the, the, if we think of these bacteria as being drawn from a random distribution, that distribution over time, you know, in the beginning of the time series is not the same distribution uh, as, as later in the time series. Um, we can identify these bacteria and they all seem to change before the flare-up. So, so I'm hopeful that um, there are changes in the microbiome that occur before patients have inflammation and before patients uh, have symptoms, and that we can use this to intervene um, uh, 
before patients have flare-offs to, to ward off those flare-ups. Because it's hard to develop new drugs. It takes a long time. It's a difficult process. But if we know a little bit more about the dynamics of diseases like this, then maybe we can use the drugs we do have more effectively. Okay. <clears throat> um, we can also see, so, you know, I said the, um, the microbiome really uh, kind of adapts to a host, and uh, there's a natural, uh, maybe it's not natural, but there's a clinical um, uh, intervention where we actually take a microbiome from one person, we put it into another person. So it's a, a fecal transplant. Uh, and in 2013, we spun out an organization called Open Biome, and Open Biome basically provided fecal transplants to patients with recurrent C. difficile infections. And uh, Open Biome's treated about 70,000 uh, patients. And um, the idea behind uh, fecal transplant, especially for recurrent C. difficile infection, is uh, goes something like this. So we can think of the healthy gut ecosystem as this, uh, this forest in the top left. And now patients with an otherwise healthy gut ecosystem might get given uh, antibiotics for you know, unrelated condition. Those antibiotics can be like clear cutting the forest. When we clear cut the forest, uh, that allows the overgrowth of, of weeds, basically, invasive species. And so those weeds, uh, in, in some cases, are uh, bacteria like Clostridium difficile. Um, and so the, uh, you know, C. diff comes up, uh, and now the patient has an acute infection, and so what do we do? Well, we give, we give the patient um, more antibiotics, but really we're just returning them to that you know, clear-cut uh, forest state um, that's just, it's very permissive uh, for the growth of those weeds. Now, so some of the patients won't recur, um, but uh, often, you know, many of the patients will. And once a patient recurs, of course, you know, we're going we're gonna to treat them with antibiotics again and again, and the more times that a patient recurs, the more likely they are to recur the next time. And so patients get caught in these very long cycles um, where they take vancomycin to cure, cure the infection, um, but then they just get infected again a, a few weeks later. And we can, we can stop this cycle by taking um, healthy gut, uh, a healthy gut ecosystem and putting it into, into that patient after they've received antibiotics to, you know, to, to grow uh, a healthy ecosystem that's going to be more resistant uh, to the emergence of these weeds. So <clears throat> this is a procedure um, that uh, we've been doing at Open Biome, um, and we're also lucky enough to be part of a, a study at Mass General Hospital a number of years ago uh, run by Libby Homan, where... Uh, they took four donors and, and they treated uh, uh, about 20 different patients, and we were able to use sequencing to really understand what's going on. So I want to show you what that looks like. So on the top, so, you know, I, what I'm not showing you here is the names of the bacteria. Those would be on the, on the different columns. But the three different rows there... Um, first is our patient. Um, this is a, a Clostridium difficile patient uh, before they get a transplant. And so blue here means there's more of that bacteria. White means they don't have the bacteria. And, you know, the darker the color, the more of the bacteria. Um, the middle is the donor. So this is the healthy volunteer who donated um, gut bacteria to the patient. Uh, and, and the bottom is, like, what that patient looks like after getting the donor material. So can you guess what the rule is? So if you're like me, you know, you probably first thought like, well, it's, you know, it's like a, a patient plus donor, but it's really not, right? Then it would just be a big blue stripe, uh, you know, and then maybe you thought about, well, maybe it's like an AND gate or an OR gate or something like that. Um, but it, it, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really follow uh, any of those rules. 
Um, but a, uh, a, a really bright um, graduate student of mine, Chris Smiley, uh, came up with a machine learning algorithm uh, that he trained on these data um, that actually makes uh, uh, qualitatively and, and quantitatively pretty good predictions. And um, there's, there's some surprising things I think we can learn from, from these algorithms and so uh, if you look at the very, at, at the corner um, on, on the far right, the column on the far right, you can see that uh, pre-FMT, this patient didn't have the bacteria. Um, Post-FMT, or uh, sorry, the, the, the donor didn't have the bacteria. Post-FMT, the patient picked up this bacteria. So this is a patient that wasn't in the, in the um, uh, patient initially, and it wasn't in the donor. But after the procedure, they picked up this particular bacteria. Um, and none of that is super surprising. <laughs> what's, what's really surprising is that the algorithm predicted they would pick up that bacteria. And so the first time I gave this talk, somebody pointed that out, um, you know, asking a, a question at the end of the talk. And I was like, oh, my God, you, you know, there must be something wrong with our training set. We must have, like, overtrained that. And, um, but I, I went back and, and, and looked, and there are these bacteria that um, seem to do well. Uh, so this is a bacteria that often just um, uh, pops up after a, a fecal transplant. And so, so we're seeing that um, when we change the environment, that can uh, have an effect on, on selecting which members of the uh, ecosystem emerge. <clears throat> um, we can do a little better, and uh, we can look at uh, not just the species. So what I was showing you there is like which species are present. But if we look at the same species, so there'll be species that are present in, let's say, oh, 70, 80 percent of the people in this room might have, you know, uh, some strain of uh, Bacteroides uh, fragilis or, or something like that. Uh, a, a really popular strain, a uh, really popular species. But if we were to isolate that bacteria from, from each of us and compare it, uh, I would guess, I would guess that no two people, unless they were, you know, maybe living in the same household or something like that, uh, would have the same strain. And so bacteria that have a different strain, um, they'll have on the order of maybe 10,000 um, individual nucleotide differences in their DNA. And they'll actually differ by hundreds or even thousands of uh, additional genes that one strain has and, and the other doesn't. And so uh, we developed an algorithm that can, uh, that can look at all the uh, reads we get from metagenomics. And, and metagenomics is where we take many, many um, short reads, and we don't we don't really even know which uh, species each read came from. We don't know where it came from in the genome, what species it came from. Uh, and then we have this puzzle to figure out, which is uh, how do we put it all back together to, to know what's there? Well, fortunately, um, <clears throat> as I'll talk about later, uh, we've been involved in isolating a lot of these bacteria in pure culture so we can get their genomes. And then we can, we can take these random reads, these, these short stretches of DNA, and then we can map them onto, onto references. And when we do that, um, we look for these, uh, these differences and, you know, like single nucleotide differences. We call them SNPs. Uh, in the DNA sequence where, you know, one strain will have an A and one strain will have a T, for example. And so what we're able to do is um, we're able to look into a particular sample and we can identify how many different strains of bacteria are there um, and roughly, you know, what's the um, proportion of different strains. You know, maybe it's 30% um, strain one and 70% strain two, um, but all matching the same species of bacteria. And so he, here's an example of uh, how I'm going to uh, represent this data to you. So let's imagine that we have some species of bacteria, and our uh, 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 FMT patient um, is represented by the blue strain, okay? So we have a, like a pie chart there. It's 100% blue. They have one strain, and it, it's the blue strain. We have a donor that uh, is, you know, has one strain, and it's the yellow strain. And then we perform an FMT, and now the patient has uh, you know, a lot of blue and a little bit of yellow. That's, that's one possible outcome. Okay? 
Well, let's, let's look at a few different examples. So here we can look at uh, Klebsiella uh, pneumonia. Um, so the, the, the first example un under my hypothetical one. And here we have two patients. So uh, each of the patients had a few different strains of Klebsiella initially. The donor didn't have any. And the patient uh, kept all of those strains of, uh, of Klebsiella after the fecal transplant. Okay. Um, Here's another example in the middle, Fecalibacterium presnitiae. This is a bacteria that's thought to um, actually be very healthful and is associated with a good, um, uh, sort of like a, a healthy gut state. And here the patient didn't have any, but the donor had some, and then uh, the donor transferred all those strains uh, to the patient. Okay? If we look at E. coli, we see a, a different story. So here we see uh, the same donor, okay? Um, two different patients, and in, in the top patient, um, you know, we put the donor material in, the top patient looks pretty much like they did before the fecal transplant. So they kept their, you know, their patient strains and didn't really take up uh, many donor strains. Um, whereas the second patient, uh, it was the opposite. They ended up with a lot of E. coli from the donor and uh, only a little bit of material um, that they had already. And the last one is, uh, I think, uh, one of the most interesting. So if you look at the very bottom column, um, the patient has these mostly blue strains. The donor has these uh, purple strains. And then we do the fecal transplant. Um, and now the most abundant strain is this red strain. And we look for that red strain um, in all of the other patients that were treated in that donor. Um, we looked really hard for that strain, and we absolutely couldn't find it. And we found that uh, this was actually very common. So this behavior of um, <clears throat> uh, only a fraction of the, the species, we call them OTUs, operational taxonomic units, because we don't have a great idea on how to define species in bacteria, only a fraction of the OTUs will actually engraft in the patient. So we put 100 in, maybe 25 end up uh, sticking around in the, in, in the patient long term. But if, if a particular species engrafts in the patient and the donor has five strains of that particular species, then all five strains engraft. They're not independent at all. And, and this was surprising. And in addition, um, we find very commonly that if a patient has never had this particular species before, we put in some donor material that, um, that has a new species, the patient will end up with all of the strains from the donor plus these new strains, like that red strain, that weren't in the patient, they weren't in the donor, but like once there was like a critical mass and, and enough different strains of a particular species, now the patient can pick up new strains of that species from the environment, uh, which I think is really fascinating uh, and I have, uh, I have no explanation for. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think we have... Uh, I want to move quickly through, uh, through this next section um, because I, I, I do want to um, tell you about uh, these bacteria that exchange genes. So um, how do bacteria uh, adapt to the environment? Um, well, I talked about how the microbiome restructures itself, right? How new species come in, species uh, go out, the uh, quantity of a particular species goes up and down. Um, <clears throat> but what about those bacterial genomes themselves? How do they adapt to their host? So that was a question that was asked by uh, Tammy Lieberman, uh, Lieberman, who's now a professor at MIT, and um, uh, Jay Zhao, who is a graduate student uh, and, and is now a, a postdoc at the Broad Institute. And what they did is they isolated a number of different strains of the same species, Bacteroides fragilis. Uh, they isolated those strains uh, many different strains from a single person, 
uh, and then they did that for multiple individuals. So for multiple individuals, they isolated, let's say, uh, 30 different, um, 30 different um, isolates of, of the same strain. Okay. Now, why would they do that? Those isolates are going to be uh, identical. Well, almost, almost. Okay. So um, as these things acquire mutations, we'll, we'll see those mutations crop up. And if those mutations have some selective advantage, well, we'll see those mutations uh, rise quite, uh, quite quickly. And then we can look at um, what, what those mutations are and, and you know, why they're arising and, and what are they doing to enhance the fitness of the organism. So these are uh, a number of different lineages. So these are, are different strains from, from different people. And um, what I'm showing here is... Uh, how many mutations uh, each lineage has had uh, relative to what we predict the DNA sequence of its ancestor was. So each of these individuals was colonized by a single clonal bacteria of this species, and uh, that clone has acquired mutations over time. Okay? Uh, and so in some cases, uh, they you know, acquire like 10 mutations, in some cases just a few, and we think, uh, we know that organisms acquire mutations uh, at the rate of about one mutation per genome per 300 generations. Okay, and that, that applies over like uh, a broad range of uh, micro microbial species. Okay, so the, the bigger the genome, the slower the accumulation of mutations per base pair, but the, the rate seems to be fairly constant if we say mutations per genome, per generation. These bacteria, if I had to guess, I'd say the generation time is probably one day. And so um, these, uh, these mutations um, we can interpret as years, right? So the ones that have uh, uh, two mutations, maybe they've been there for two years. The ones that have 10 mutations, maybe they've been there for a decade. Um, <clears throat> And we can, uh, we can run some tests. And so what we do is uh, we identify uh, mutations that seem to happen in the same gene, not just once, but uh, multiple different times separately in evolution. So, so we see this convergent evolution or, or parallel evolution where we see you know, the same genes being changed in different people. And if that rises to a level of statistical significance, we say, well, we don't think that these genes are being mutated more frequently, you know, the same gene across two different, uh, uh, two different people. What we think is happening is this gene has some important function that is specific to its human host. And when it goes into a new human host, uh, the gene quickly adapts because it, you know, it confers some fitness. And if we look at the genes that uh, satisfy that, um, that condition, what we find, at least in this species, is about half of them, <laughs> about half of them have the same name. <laughs> uh, they're called SUS-C, and uh, these are um, uh, genes involved in producing a, a polysaccharide capsule, and there are genes involved in the uptake of, uh, of polysaccharides. We can look at where those mutations are happening on the protein, and they tend to be clustered in, in the three-dimensional structure of the, of the protein, mainly to uh, this uh, hinge region and, and also the region that interacts with another gene that's known to, to function in the same pathway. And I should say, these genes all have the same name, SUS-C. It's not really the same gene. Uh, we often name genes, uh, we, we just you know, give, give new genes that we haven't seen before the name of the closest gene to that. So these are all homologs of SUS-C, but they're actually um, they're, they're, uh, different genes in the genome. So we see all the genes that sort of look very similar are the ones that are acquiring mutation. And then we can say for this particular species, um, this is what... Uh, you know, this is what evolution is, is selecting for. Um, <clears throat> and we can even look at the dynamics. So what I'm showing here um, is these are, these are different mutations that have happened, many of them in, in these SUS-C um, uh, proteins and these SUS-C genes. And you can see the amount of each mutant over time 
And I'll just uh, draw your attention, maybe the most interesting one is the blue mutant. And so you can see bl the blue mutant, it comes up around day 200, okay? And then it grows and grows in, in abundance until it fills up maybe like two thirds of the, of the graph and then it stopped. And what's really fascinating about this is uh, not that a new mutation like came up, although that was very cool to see, a uh, new mutation just arise and, and take over the whole population. Um, but the fact that it only took over two thirds of the population and then seemed to remain about steady, what that tells us is um, the, the strain that's um, represented by the orange at the bottom is very, very closely related to these other ones, but it's different enough that it doesn't seem to be competing with the other ones. So all the other strains are, are competing for a certain niche space, which is about two thirds of, of the material, at least the material that's <laughs> coming out in the poop. Um, but, the, but the orange strain is, is doing something different. And, and it doesn't matter if you're, if you're more fit at, um, in niche one, um, you, you know, you, you don't take up any more of the, the biomass and you don't compete with, with uh, genes in the other niche. Okay. So now I've told you a little bit about how genomes adapt uh, kind of uh, mutation by mutation. But genomes also adapt uh, by sharing genes. And, and this is one of my favorite topics. Um, they kind of share genes like this. So what it looks like when two bacterial cells have sex. Um, <clears throat> and I read this paper. It came out uh, a number of years ago. Uh, it came out in, in, in 2010. And it was this fascinating, fascinating story about uh, like certain enzymes that break down algal polysaccharides. And these algal polysaccharides are highly sulfonated and we don't really have the, the enzymes to, uh, to, to break them down, to, to use those nutrients. Um, the algae that, that make them, well, they've got the genes to, to break them down. And some marine microbes um, have picked up the genes. And so we can look at the sequence of the DNA and we can figure out, um, you know, if, because each, each individual gene has its own tree of life, right? Like, you know, every organism is, is descended from a common ancestor. Well, it's true for every gene, too. Uh, and some of these genes will move from organism to organism. They'll cross the species boundaries. But we can look at the DNA for a gene and, and, and we know what its history is. And so um, what, what they were able to do in the study is uh, they found that there were bacteria that are growing on uh, these algal polysaccharides. These are the same algal polysaccharides as in uh, the nori sushi wrappers, okay? So the uh, edible seaweed, edible to, to microbes, not to, not to us, although we do eat it. And they found that the bacteria that were living on these algae the way they were able to do that is they stole the genes to digest the algae from the algae. So they stole their genes and then now they follow these algae around and, 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 and they just uh, eat those polysaccharides. Um, <clears throat> and then while they were like looking for homologs of, of these genes, they found some examples of um, these genes in bacteroides that were isolated from humans. Interestingly, they were all isolated from Japanese humans, a population that eats a lot of seaweed. And so um, then they looked at the sequence of those genes and they saw that these bacteroides that lived in the gut, they, um, they had clearly gotten the genes from the marine bacteria who had gotten the genes from the algae, right? And so they, they had this beautiful story where, you know, the marine bacteria stole the genes from the algae. Some presumably Japanese person ate the seaweed. And then the bacteroides living in their gut stole the genes from the bacteria that stole them in the first place. And now they, uh, now they can digest seaweed in, in that person's gut and presumably then give some nutrients back to the host. And so that would be an advantage, not just for the bacteria, but also for the human host. And when they looked into uh, metagenomics of uh, J the Japanese uh, gut microbiome, uh, they found examples of these types of genes in pretty much all the samples they looked at. 
And when they went back and they looked in the gut samples of North Americans, they didn't find a single copy of these genes. Okay? And so even though the Japanese gut has basically the same species that we have, those species can have very different genes and carry out very different functions. And so I got really excited about this. I asked some uh, graduate students, uh, Mark Smith, uh, Jonathan Friedman, Chris Miley. Uh, I said, I want you guys to find all the examples in all the sequenced genomes um, where you've got identical DNA in two totally different species, where the only explanation for having identical DNA is that, you know, uh, the, that gene went f- crossed from one species to the other. They came back and they're like, oh, yeah, we did it. You know, Eric, we found 80,000 examples. <laughs> that was what Mark and Chris said. And that's why I brought Jonathan into the fro- project because I said, you know, these guys are they're brand new students. They don't know what they're doing. I'm sure there's not 80,000 examples. Um, but he, he double-checked it. He said, yeah, no, Eric, there's, there's 80,000 examples. And so we saw this as happening all the time across different bacterial species. And so we were able to build a map. And so we took all the bacteria that, that had uh, been sequenced up to that point, and we annotated like what environment they were found in. And they said, what is the probability if we pick two bacteria from, um, from this environment that they share an identical piece of DNA that, that they've horizontal, that's what we call it, horizontally transferred, transferred from one species to a different species. And what we found is the human body is an enormous hotspot for this sharing of, uh, of uh, genes. And so that entire top left is, is the human body. And it gets even um, more likely that two things will exchange DNA if they come from the same part of the human body. OK, now here's the, um, <clears throat> here's the really interesting part. An identical gene based on what I've told you, based on you know, how quickly these genes uh, mutate, how big a bacterial genome is, um, how many cell divisions per day, um, you could calculate that if two species have an identical gene the way we've defined it, that either that gene passed from species A to species B yesterday or 5,000 years ago. Okay, so what we found is an example of something really exciting that's happening all the time. So like if I go out and eat a bunch of seaweed, I might get that gene or a bunch of examples of things that over the past millennia have have built up in in number. And it's still cool from an academic, you know, perspective. Um, but it's qualitatively, uh, it becomes very different. Like, what is the time scale? Is it 5,000 years or is it, you know, two weeks to, for a, a species to remodel its genome by picking up a new gene that, that has a new function? Okay. I spent a lot of time, I spent uh, probably a decade trying to answer this question. I got really into uh, single cell genomics and microfluidics and... Um, uh, did a lot of work that I won't tell you about because I was never able to uh, uh, use it to, to answer this question. And then two postdocs in my lab said, Eric, um, you know, the first thing they did, so is Mathieu Grisson and uh, Mathilde Poyer, who are now um, uh, running a project called the Global Microbiome Conservancy at the University of Kiel. Um, first thing they did is uh, they isolated tens of thousands of different strains of bacteria. And then they said, Eric, you know, most of the critical biodiversity is actually present in um, the, the microbiomes of, of folks that are not living in industrialized countries. And so they started an organization called the Global Microbiome Conservancy. It's been flying around the world um, collecting this biodiversity, preserving it for future generations, um, and then uh, allowing scientists to, to use this to, to do research. And so what they did is, <clears throat> the reason I can never a- answer this question using the original data set was that all of the bacteria there they may have been isolated from uh, the human body, but every single bacteria was isolated from a different human, okay? And now here's the logic. If I were to do the same experiment 
and look at the same species of bacteria, um, you know, let's say E. coli and B. subtilis, two species of bacteria, and say, what's the probability that E. coli and B. subtilis share a gene? Oh, you know, maybe it's like 1%. They're pretty distantly related. Now, if I got an E. coli and a B. subtilis from the same human being, and I said, what's the probability that they share a gene? Well, maybe it would be 20%, because they were living in the same person. And, and if the probability that they shared a gene was higher if the two species were isolated from the same people instead of different people, then we'd say this is a process that is not happening on this time scale of millennia. It's happening on the time scale of a human life or shorter, right? OK. So we were finally able to, uh, to do that experiment. Um, by looking at data from the Global Microbiome Conservancy. Uh, and I'm really excited to report that um, the amount of horizontal gene transfer that we observed between the same two species, if they were within a person, uh, was much, much higher than if it was between people. And then we were able to uh, go a little bit further, and we said, OK, well, is this process happening faster in those urban industrialized populations, or is it happening faster in those non-industrialized rural populations? And what we found is that this hot spot of the, this idea that the human body is a hot spot of DNA um, is being driven by urban industrialized populations. So this is not a um, this is not like the way that it's been throughout human history, most likely. As we bring together uh, in big cities like this, people from many different cultures and backgrounds who may have inherited uh, microbes from their parents to carry out different functions, and we bring them all together and bring in all these, you know, these different possible uh, useful genes, we're seeing exchange of those genes at a, at a much faster rate than, uh, than we've probably seen before. This is really exciting for people me, like me who study it, uh, and also can be kind of frightening because a lot of the genes that are being transferred are uh, genes that, um, A, facilitate the rate of transfer itself, so the machinery to like make horizontal transfer even faster, um, and B, um, genes that confer resistance to our antibiotics. So, um, well, that's kind of a downer note to end on, but that, that, is, that is my last slide. Uh, but I'm happy to uh, hang out and take a few questions. <laughs>